Today I'm taking on a new challenge of truly observing the Sabbath for a whole week. So let's see how it affects my life and whether if I can keep it. In today's fast paced world, it is easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle of the constant activities that's going on. Whether it's work, social media, or just keeping up with our daily tasks, our lives are often filled to the brim. But in the midst of all this business, there's a commandment that often overlooked, yet it's incredibly relevant to our well-being. I'm talking, of course, of the fourth commandment, remembering the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. That's what we're going to be diving into today. Without further ado, let's get started. We have our Bibles open up to Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11, and it reads, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. We look at the Life Application Study Bible and let's see what the notes tell us. The Sabbath was a day set aside for rest and worship. God commanded the Sabbath because human beings need to spend unhurried time in worship and rest each week. A God who is concerned enough to provide a day each week for us to rest is indeed wonderful. To observe a regular time of rest and worship in our fast-paced world demonstrates how important God is to us, and it gives us the extra benefit of refreshing our spirit. Don't forget God's provision. We also look at the cross-reference. In the cross-reference for verse 11, it gives us Acts chapter 2, verse 4. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voice together in prayer to God, O Sovereign Lord, Creator of heaven and earth, and the sea, and everything in them. Let's talk about what verses 8 to 11 means. For verse 8, we ask ourselves, who is to obey this commandment in verse 8? Well, all of us. When we take a look at Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus tells us, Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. I also looked at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to act of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And of course, we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in the sixth day, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. So now we know that all believers are to obey this commandment and rest on the Sabbath day and keep it holy. When looking at verses 9 to 10, we must ask ourselves, what is the charge of this commandment? You shall work for six days, right? No work whatsoever should be done on the Sabbath by anyone under your authority, including animals and strangers. Let's take a look at some scriptures that support exactly what I'm saying. We take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of, of his return drawing near. We look at Mark chapter 1, verse 21, and it says, Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. We look at Luke chapter 4, verse 16. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. We look at Acts chapter 13, verse 14. Paul and Barnabas travel inward to Antioch of Poseida. On the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue for the services. And we take a look at Acts chapter 20, verse 11 again. For in the sixth day of the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. 
but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. I also looked at Exodus chapter 23, verse 12. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day you must stop working. This gives your ox and your donkeys a chance to rest. It allows your slaves and the foreigners living among you to be refreshed. And I looked at Exodus chapter 31, verse 14, and it reads, You must keep the Sabbath day, for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death, and anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. So now let's focus on verse 11. Verse 11, I asked myself this, why did God give us this commandment though? Well, because the seventh day is to be a day of rest. The Lord says it. Also, I also said to myself, well, because the seventh day is to be a day of worship. The Lord blessed it and it should be made holy. And then I also had to ask myself, what is the decision required by this commandment? And I seen obedience. See guys, the Sabbath day is only a shadow, a picture, a type, a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is exactly what the scripture says. And so this took me to Colossians chapter two, verses 16 to 17. Don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. So you see the Sabbath rest and worship points to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Sabbath is a picture of the perfect rest and worship that Jesus Christ brings to man. The Sabbath gives a man a day to rest and to worship him. It gives a man rest in itself, a complete perfect rest, a perfect worship, a perfect assurance that we are acceptable to God. With that being said, it tells us, Jesus gives us the rest of salvation and deliverance, rest from the burdens of our sins. We see this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, and it reads, then Jesus says, come to me, all of you who, who are weary and carry in heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus also gives us a rest of freedom, rest from the bondage and enslavement to our sins. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. We also see that Jesus gives us rest from condemnation. I seen this in Romans chapter eight, verse one and verse three. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. We also see that Jesus gives us rest of conquest and victory and glorious liberation of living a life above the terrible trials and suffering of this world, of just being in this world. I've seen this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but that God has made us his captives and continue to lead us among in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. I also looked at 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 to 5. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus also gives us the rest of guidance. I've seen this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Jesus says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I found this in John chapter 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. And I've seen this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The temptation in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful, and he will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out 
so that you can endure. Jesus also gives us the rest of provision. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And I found this in my favorite Bible verse, Psalms chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right path, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protects and comforts me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I also seen in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, that Jesus gives us the assurance of security and protection. I found this in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 and verses 37 to 39. Can anything ever separate us from Jesus' love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angel nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed, nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We also see that Jesus in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, Jesus gives us rest of a fruitful life, the rest of satisfaction and fulfillment within our lives. Jesus shows us this in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, I seen that Jesus gives us the rest of eternal life. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 2 to 3, There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Jesus gives us rest from our human souls. I seen this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We also seen that Jesus gives us rest of peace and rest from my anxieties. I found this in John chapter 14, verse 27, and Jesus says, I am leaving with a gift, a peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. I also looked at John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus asked, do you finally believe? And I looked at Philippians chapter four, verses six to seven. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. And this brought me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Now this brings us to the obedience part of verse 11. We must follow the Lord's example and worship one day a week, consistently and regularly. I found this in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood to read the scriptures. Another sign of obedience, we must not forsake our worship, the assembling together with other believers. I found this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. A part of our obedience is we are to bring our offerings to the Lord on the day of worship. I seen this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse two. On the first day of the, each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned 
Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. Another part of our obedience is we must not fail to worship regularly, lest others criticize our testimony for Christ. I found this in Romans chapter 14 verses 5 to 6. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on the special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. Also, we must have obedience to work six days and then rest and worship on the Sabbath. We see this in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 10. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. The, this includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. We must keep the Sabbath, not just to do what we want or feel like doing on the Sabbath. I've seen this in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 3. Each of you must show great respect for your mother and father, and you must always observe my Sabbath day of rest. I am the Lord your God. And I've seen this in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 to 14. Keep the Sabbath day and don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly. And we must rejoice and be glad on the Sabbath, for it is the day the Lord has made for us all. And I've seen this in Psalms chapter 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. All right, quick recap. The commandments is more than just an outdated rule. It is an invitation to rest, recharge, and refocus our priorities. In an age where burnout is a major concern, the concept of taking a day off each week is more necessary than ever before. But what does it mean to truly observe the Sabbath? And why is it so critical to today's society? We explore the commandments, and I wanted to encourage you to ask yourself the same question as I did. Are you taking time to rest and recharge each week? Or are you letting the demands of daily life consume you? The answer might just surprise you. In the Bible, the Sabbath is first mentioned in the book of Exodus, where God commands the Israelites to keep the Sabbath day holy. But why was the command given in the first place? Well, to understand the significance of the Sabbath, we needed to look at the historical context. When God created the world, the worked for six days and rested on the seventh. The pattern was instituted by God himself and it's repeated throughout the Bible. In the earlier Christian church era, the Sabbath continued to play a vital role in the lives of believers. It was a day of worship, fellowship, and rest, set apart from the other six days of the week. But as Christianity spread it throughout the world, the Sabbath began to take on a different meaning and practice. For example, in Judaism, the Sabbath is still observed from Friday evening, Saturday evening, while strict rules govern what can and cannot be done during that time. In other Christian denominations, Sunday became the main day of worship, often referred to as the Lord's Day. Yet despite these differences, the core principle of the Sabbath remains the same, to set aside a time for rest, worship, and rejuvenation. At its heart, the fourth commandment is an invitation to trust in God's provision and his sovereignty. By observing the Sabbath, we're declaring that we believe God is capable of sustaining us, even when we're not working or striving. In an act of faith, one that requires us to let go of our need for control and surrender to God's will. So what does it mean to observe the Sabbath in today's world? It means setting aside each week a day for to focus on what truly matters, our relationship with God and with others. 
It means to take a break from our usual routines and indulging in activities that bring us joy and rest. And it means trusting that God will provide for us, even when we're not working or striving. Of course, observing the Sabbath can be challenging, especially in a world that values productivity and achievement above all else. But the benefits far outweigh the cost. When we take time to rest and recharge, we become more productive and more focused and more compassionate. We also become more aware of our own limitations and more dependent on God's strength and guidance. In the Bible, we see numerous examples of the Sabbath's importance. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus reminds us that the Pharisees, that the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. In Hebrews chapter 4, we're encouraged to enter into God's rest, just as the Israelites entered into the promised land. And in Isaiah chapter 58, we're shown the blessings that come from observing the Sabbath, including deliverance, healing, and restoration. Guys, throughout history, we've seen our countless examples of the Sabbath's transform transformative power. In the 17th and 18th century, the Puritans observed the Sabbath with great rigor, setting aside a whole day of worship, prayer, and rest. In more recent times, individuals like Tim Keller and Nancy Guthrie had written extensively on the importance of the Sabbath, keeping in modern time, in modern life. But what about those who argue that the Sabbath is no longer relevant in today's society? Some claim that the commandments was meant for Israel alone, or that it's been abolished by Jesus' death and resurrection. Others argue too fast paced to accommodate a day of rest each week. To these objections, I would say that the Sabbath is more relevant than ever before. In an age where burnout and anxiety are rampant, we need the Sabbath more than ever before. Recharge and to refocus our priorities. We need a day to remember that we're not the ones in control, but God rather is in one who created us and sustained us. As we conclude in this exploration of the fourth commandment, I wanna leave you with a challenge. Take a few minutes to reflect on your own Sabbath, keeping practices. Are you taking time to rest and recharge each week? Are you prioritizing your relationship with God and your relationship with others? I encourage you to make this Sabbath a priority in your life starting today and see the transformative power it can bring. I definitely want to thank you for watching and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Sabbath in the comment section below. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, be sure to check out the next video that just popped up on your screen. I want to tell you, God bless you. God bless your family. And I'll see you in the next. And let's do our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is thy kingdom, thy power, and thy glory forever and ever. And we all say, Amen. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.